Okay, so um, here we are again. I know it's now quarter past six, we're a whole 15 minutes late because we're trying out new stuff. Well, technology has uh, left us with some challenges. But what we don't know now is if using this technology that we moved to is going to work. And if there's anybody who stuck around for the 15 minutes that we've been battling about. So um, if you're there, let us know. If you can hear us, let us know because it's, uh, oh, you can hear us, we've got a thumbs up. Good. So then, um, if you're all sitting comfortably, which you probably are by now, uh, we, we should begin. So um, let's uh, let's go to where I was going to start as we come to our service at Home Communion, which is which is just to say to everybody, thank you for being here. Thanks for sticking with us through this uh, hiccup at the beginning, um, and also to say. Um, I hope you've got some bread and wine with you at home that you can have with you and you can share in together as we come to share in it here in the church building as we gather at the Lord's table. And um, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be joining with you, even in this way, uh, this evening. So uh, as we come to worship the Lord, I wanted to open with some words from Psalm 145, which is one of the Psalms set for today. And uh, the first few verses say this, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. <laughs> And I will meditate on your wonderful works. There's a declaration, a determination to praise the Lord. And we've shown a bit of that determination this evening as we've tried to get to this point of worshiping together online. Um, so let's pray. And then when we pray, we will do what that psalmist was doing. We will praise and extol the name of the Lord. But Father, as we come to worship you this evening, as we come before you, as we approach the throne of grace in which you reign, we pray that we would meet with you. We would know that you are present with us wherever we are. And Lord, as your spirit moves in us and through us, that same spirit will draw us deeper into the knowledge and love of you. And draw us up into a worship <clears> of <throat> We commit ourselves to you for this purpose. In the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing our first song, which is uh, Psalm 23, with the refrain, I will trust in you alone. Thank you. 
Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against the holy servant Jesus in the night. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders in the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ian. So let's pray as we come to uh, consider those words from Acts and this uh, next lesson on prayer in this series we've been considering over these last few weeks. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for your word to us. And we simply ask this evening that your spirit would be at work in us, Lord, enabling us to hear what you have to say. Give us ears to hear your voice and nothing else. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been talking a lot about prayer over the last few weeks, whether it's been in here live or whether it's been online. Going back three weeks ago, we had a focus on Abraham, a faithful prayer from a faithful prayer haggling with God over the righteous that remain in Sodom and Gomorrah. Following that, we saw uh, Mark Rainsbury uh, dealing so effectively with Hannah's desperate prayer at the temple, with Eli looking on, and her desperation for a child, leading her to pray in the way that she did. There were lessons for us to learn there. And this morning, in church and online, uh, preaching about Jesus and intercessory prayer, that great high priestly prayer of his uh, from John 17. And, and tonight we continue to ask the Bible to school us in prayer and how we should pray. And we're doing it this evening by coming to uh, the story of the Acts of the Apostles. We're in Acts chapter 4 and we're looking at the whole thing of urgent prayer. When something urgent happens, how do we pray? It doesn't take much to imagine the situation, as it's, as it's something that most of us have encountered or will encounter at some point or other in our lives. The phone rings, and the person on the other end is bringing you some shock or bad news. An urgent situation is unfolding. Maybe a small child is at death's door. Maybe someone has gone missing. Uh, maybe there's been a tragic accident. Someone's been diagnosed with cancer, and the call has come your way. Can you please pray? In that urgent situation, please pray for what's going on. But again, the question comes, how do we pray? How do we respond to that urgent request for prayer? Well, Acts 4, our reading this evening, paints a picture of just such an urgent situation. There's no telephones involved, but two people are running and returning to their friend with a troubling story of their arrest. Go back in chapter four, that's earlier than our readings, uh, verses one to three, and you get the story of what's happened to Peter and to John. But they've been arrested. They've received threats at the hands of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. In chapter 4 and verse 21, you can, you can see those threats laid out really clearly. And those threats have come because of their faith, because of the faith of Peter and John and the actions that that faith has inspired. Peter and John were being grilled by the ruling council of the Jewish people. 
The Sanhedrin were trying, in response to Peter healing a cripple back in chapter 3, if you read all about that, they were trying to put an end to the growing following of the disciples of Jesus. The, the, they were trying to end the momentum, the healing of a cripple, the teaching about the resurrection, all that that was gaining momentum. They were trying to put a stop to it because they were threatened by it. And their threat led them to issue threats against Peter and John. This was no small thing that they were facing. This was the powerhouse of Jerusalem. And actually, not just of Jerusalem, but all Israel, bringing their collective weight behind the opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were trying to stop the way, which is what Christianity was called in, in that time, in those very early deaths of the faith. They were trying to stop the growth of the way. After a spirit-filled defense by Peter and John, back in chapter 4, verses 8 to 12, this body are trying to silence them. And they breathed out threats against them. This situation they faced was urgent. It was serious. It was a threat. It could lead to them receiving a beating, imprisonment, or even death like their master had suffered. Now, Peter and John couldn't pick up the phone, but their response and the response of the other apostles is helpful to us in understanding how best to prayerfully respond to urgent situations. So what is the first thing that happens? Well, Peter and John immediately return to their own people. Verse 23, on their release, on their release from all that interrogation and all those threats, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. They came to their people, they gathered them in one place, and they give a full account of what's happened. And that's when we learn that in verse 24, when they heard this, when they heard the full account of everything that happened, they raised their voices together in prayer. An urgent situation demanded an urgent prayer response, and they went to the only place where that was going to be possible. They went back to their people. And there is, we're told in the New Testament, a particular power of work when the people of God come together and agree together in prayer, even when it's just two people. According to Jesus, he tells us that in Matthew 18, verses 19 to 20. If two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. And here's our first lesson in prayer. Draw together with brothers and sisters in Christ in the face of the urgent situation. Share the need and raise voices together in prayer. That's why it's important for us to be connected to one another in the body of Christ. That's why prayer triplets are important. That's why home groups are important. That's why we need one another. Because our prayers together, as we come together in response to what's going on in our lives and around us make a difference. There's power in coming together to pray. The apostles knew that, and that's what they did. And when they pray, we need to notice something. We need to notice, firstly, that they begin with God. Just like Jesus did in John 17 this morning, he began with God and his glory. Here, the disciples fall upon their knees in prayer, raise their voices in prayer, and their first call of call is the Lord. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. They fall upon the Lord. They begin there. They're not beginning with their urgent list of what needs to be sorted out. They begin with God. Where else would you start? Call on his name and remember who he is. Because he provides the real context, the real picture of what life is really all about. They come to the one who is in control. 
And the word used here, the Greek word used here, is despotes, which is despots, someone who is totally in control. It's used of slave owners elsewhere in the New Testament. Indicates a ruler of unchallengeable power. That's who they're coming to with their prayer. The one with unchallengeable power. However bad the circumstances or situation, however bad the threats of a powerful ruling council, God is still God. He is sovereign. And that's where our prayers need to begin. So they begin with God. What do they do next? Well, then the gathered people of God, they remember that what they face is not new to the God that they're approaching. Nothing is new to him. They remember who he is, and then they remember that what they face is not new to him. And in actual fact, here in this passage, they remember scriptures that describe their situation from the history of God's people. Verses 25 to 26. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. What they are facing as apostles is nothing new. God's faced this before, and then remembering that helps them in their, in their prayer. And then go on, they remember too, that even the death of Jesus was within God's power and plan, pointing again to his lordship and his sovereignty. Indeed, Herod, in verse 27, it says, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate went together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to spy against your holy servant Jesus, who you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. As they pray to God, they remember that everything's in his hands and that nothing is new to him. Even the death of Jesus, their leader, their Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. In his death was in the power and hands of God. The God they were praying to is in control, always has been and always will be. Remembering Israel's history underlines that call. Remembering what happened to Jesus underlines that call. And that's the sense that these acknowledgements bring. They face their fears and threats in the context of the will of the sovereign God of the universe. Nothing they face is too big for him. Therefore, whilst they are in him, and he is with them, nothing is too big for them. So they begin with God. They remember that what they face isn't new to God. And then, in that context, they trust him with the threat. The threat to them and their lives and their freedom. They trust him with it. In verse 29, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word. Now, that phrase, now, Lord, consider their threats, has the sense of them saying to God, Lord, just please keep their threats in the front of your mind. He's not asking them to do anything specific in that prayer. He's asking them to keep their threats in mind. It's an astonishing prayer. They trust him. They effectively say, you take care of the threats. And then we'll get on with the work that you've given us to do. Look how verse 30 goes on. Oh, even in the second half of verse 29. And we'll consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You take care of the threats. We'll get on with the work you ask us to do. Actually, they go further than that. They ask together for greater boldness and more miracles in the face of these threats. They don't ask the Lord to take the threats away. They declare their trust in him and trust that he will keep those threats in mind. Notice too, they don't pray against their enemies either. They're not praying for judgment to fall on that nasty Sanhedrin who were threatening them with all sorts of things. Or they don't even pray for the church to know peace and safety. They ask for miracles of mercy, not miracles of vengeance and destruction. Notice that here. 
our inclination is frequently different to that. Well, mine is anyway, if I'm being honest. But they ask for miracles of mercy, not for miracles of vengeance or destruction. They want to see more of the kingdom breaking in. They want more boldness with God's words. This is their response to urgent need, to come together, to raise together their voices in prayer, to remember the sovereignty of God, and to trust that, that to trust that sovereign power as they press on for his sake and for the sake of the kingdom of God. Do we recognize that shape to our prayers when the urgent moments come? It's an important lesson for us here from the apostles. Our common frailty is exposed in such urgent situations. That's why we need the strength that comes from raised voices together, coming together to pray, and to trust in the power of that coming together. I think we let go of that too easily sometimes in the church. We plow on our own single throws when there's power in coming together to pray. That's why, my, that's why my heart breaks a little bit. We have a prayer meeting and there's not loads of people coming because they're, they're denying that power that's available to us. And that's just not being having you to come to prayer meetings. It's trying to get you to see and grasp the importance of the power that Jesus has promised when we come together to pray. And the other thing we need to remember too is that you know, if we were facing fire or flood or crime or a medical emergency, we wouldn't try and cope on our own. We run to the phone, we call for the emergency services, uh, the general moment appropriate to come. And it should be the same in relation to prayer. And the, thing, the things that we face there, the urgent, the practical, the physical, the spiritual battles, we need to pick up the phone and we need to call together the emergency services and we need to recognize that we all belong to that emergency service. We all can respond urgently in prayer if we do it in the way that the apostles have laid out here for us. Another great example from the Bible. In the face of urgent situations, physical and spiritual, call the people together in prayer. Remember what God has done. Trust him with the threat. Leave it in his hands to sort out. And then persevere with his purposes. That is the heart of their prayer. That's what they ask for. And actually read on and see the fruit of that prayer. That approach had an impact beyond our reading today. The place, well, actually in our reading today, first of all, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. The place shook, they were filled with the Spirit. They were more bold in their speaking of God's word. But read on further past verse 32. The disciples were bonded together of one heart and mind, sharing possessions with one another to the benefit of each other. Our immediate problems may be different to theirs in Acts, but it's the same God who calls us to prayer and the same Holy Spirit who fills the place and the people, giving us what we need. You will find too that if we come together and pray, you will be bound together even more by our shared concerns and our prayers. And more than that, we will find that He will be there, just as He promised. Just as He promised. We trust that promise. And even if the need is there, Come together and pray. Let's do that just now. Lord God, we do recognize you for who you are, that you are the sovereign Lord of all, and that you have called us to follow you through your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to return to you, to be reconciled to you, to be equipped with your Spirit that we might live. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your word. It reveals to us the depths of prayer and where it can take us. And we pray that we would hear from you, Lord, your spirit would convict us in our hearts 
from these examples of the Bible, how we should pray, how we should come to you, the Lord, the Lord and talk with you, and share with you, and lean on you, and depend on you. We thank you that we can do that because of the blood of Jesus. We thank you that we can do that because the Spirit leads us there. And we thank you for the love that lies behind you. By your Spirit, keep us faithful in all kinds of prayer. Keep us faithful in times of urgency. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Due to our awkward start, uh, we've shrunk things down a little, so we've got to have a song. We're going to go straight to our prayers and intercession, carrying on from where we were. So let's uh, let's pray and intercede for the world around us. And Father God, we pray as the apostles pray. We pray as Jesus prayed, remembering who you are. You are our Father in heaven. You are the creator of all. You made the heavens and the earth. Lord, your hand, your breath is even upon us in the creation of us. And we thank you for the majesty and for the power, for the glory, for the authority, for the wonder that is you. We thank you for your love that reaches down from the glory of heaven and touches our lives. Turns us around and helps us to walk in your way. We praise you for the wonder of who you are. We do this because of Jesus. We do this in his name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And this evening, as we pray, Heavenly Father, we're praying for a nation that is uh, seemingly being swapped again by coronavirus. And whatever the reasons, and, and whatever the arguments around, Lord, we're facing uh, another difficult situation in this nation. As the number of infections rises in the thousands, we want to pray for your hand, the hand that created the heavens, the hand that was a healing hand. We cry out to you in the fight to bring your healing to our nation, to put an end to the coronavirus, to instill that the people of this nation of wisdom that would help them to break free from the grip of this virus. We pray for wisdom for our government to make the right decisions at the right time in the right way. Lord, equip them with what they need at this impossible time. They might leave this country in your ways. Turn their hearts and minds to you, Lord. They might remember who you are too. And that might inspire them. Your wisdom might be upon them. When we cry out to you to turn this situation around, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we pray for our communities that are being so affected by the, the ripple effects of this virus. We pray for every home where there's a struggle to put food on the table because someone's lost their job or they may be done furlough is coming to an end, whatever the, the economic reason for that. The business has had to close. There's so many reasons why poverty is biting at this time. And Lord, we pray to you, the God, the God who is known as Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And we cry out to you, Lord, through your church, through your people, through your own direct intervention, reach into these places of need where these families struggle. Bring your provision to bear. We pray for food banks. We pray for the likes of CAP and community money advice. We pray for all who are reaching into the, the desperation that surrounds us at the moment. And we pray that that will transform their situations. Lord, they wouldn't go hungry, that they wouldn't be penniless. A lot that would be improved because of your involvement. 
will be known as hero. And Father, tonight we also pray for those who are known to us who are in a place of struggle and need your healing power to be at work. We remember, Lord Jesus, that when you walked this earth, you just said the word and someone was healed. You they just touched your cloak and they were healed. And we cry out to you, the Lord of disease, Lord over disease, to reach into the lives of those people who are known to us, who need your healing touch at this time. There are people struggling with their mental health. There are people struggling with grief. Lord, bring them peace and comfort. We pray especially tonight for Rosemary Virtue. Lord, praying for you to heal her, to bring her strength and an awareness of your presence. We pray the same for Martin Levin in his continued recovery. We pray the same for Mark Lane in all that he faces next week. Lord, these people bring your power to work in their lives. And for a very short moment of time, we name others in our hearts before the Lord. And Father, for these people, we declare our trust in you. We pray with faith. Your work to be done in their lives. Lord, for these prayers and for all our prayers this evening, we commit them to you in the powerful name of Jesus. So at this moment, we're going to move to the communion table, and this is where you should get your bread and your wine ready at home, have it in front of you. And uh, we're going to uh, but through the prayer of consecration, and in one moment, I'll tell you when, as we share it here, when you can be sharing it at home. So we're doing it together, breaking bread and drinking wine, just as the Lord taught us. Uh, and so uh, let's, let's, let's be about that. Now, at this point, we would ordinarily share the peace. So the peace of the Lord is always with you. Also, and with, also you. with you. You might want to be doing that at home with one another if there's more than one of you there. If not, just know that you're sharing that same peace with us. So the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. His dying and rising has set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels, praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his commands, Send your Holy Spirit, the broken bread and wine out pour, may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you. Gave it to them and said, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for men for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. 
Brent is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. And as Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom of power and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is to be made ready for those who love him and want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith, and you who have little. You who have been here often, and you who have not been for a long time. And you who are trying to follow, and you who are failing. Come, not because I invite you. It is our Lord. It is his will that those who want him should reach him. And this is the time at home, if you have bread and wine with me, you should share it with one another as we do the same here. Having received from the Lord, we pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. for all that he's done, as we thank him for his death on the cross for us, we declare that to be an amazing act of grace, as is the amazing thing that we can come before the throne of grace in prayer, in all the ways that the Bible teaches us. So our final hymn this evening is Amazing Grace.
conversation with you and concern for us. So lead us, we pray this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we pray that your blessing, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would be with us and remain with us all of us. Amen. Amen. Let's go in peace. Alone, serve the Lord. In the, In the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.